Welcome everyone to the first People Science Virtual Table Talk, where I got together a bunch of really brilliant thinkers to discuss uh, a pressing topic. Today we're going to talk about a new paper called Rethinking Time, Implications for Well-Being by uh, Cassie McGilner, Hal Hirschfeld, and Jennifer Acker. Uh, and uh, joining us is one of the co-authors of that paper, Hal Hirschfeld. Uh, Hal is a Hal is an associate professor of marketing and behavioral decision making at UCLA's Anderson School of Management, and we're joined today uh, with two Hal's left on the screen. Hal, why don't you wave so everyone knows who you are? Uh, to his left is Ari Wallach. Uh, Ari spent over a decade working at the intersection of innovation and strategy and social change, and he recently founded Long Path an initiative focusing on cultivating long-term ways of thinking, being, and behaving in the individual, organizational, and societal realms. Uh, and from my perspective, Ari brings a very, like, how do we practically apply this stuff perspective. Uh, also, if we move down counterclockwise, we have Kimberly Wade uh, Benzoni, hi, who is an associate professor of business administration uh, at and center at the Center of Leadership and Ethics. Oh, I'm sorry, an associate professor of business administration and Center of Leadership and Ethics scholar at the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University. And finally, to her right is Lori Paul. Lori, raise your hand. Awesome. Who is a professor of philosophy at Yale University? So you see, we have a fantastic mix of uh, contributors today to talk about time. Uh, very briefly, I want to let everyone know how this idea came about, how I wanted to bring this together. Uh, as I was working on my book recently, we were talking about the issue of self-control. We wrote a book, Dan Ariely and I wrote a book about how consumers are infected by behavioral economics, make poor decisions, and how they can change things. And we realized that even those that were educated and knew the best decisions to make still faced the issue of self-control. They still didn't make the best decisions, particularly things like savings and retirement, and one of the big factors facing people and why they, we found they couldn't make these decisions and overcome self-control was a disconnect between their present selves and their future selves. The fact that they didn't value their future selves as much as they did their present selves and the temptations of now, something called hyperbolic discounting, which we may get into more. Uh, Dan suggested I contact uh, a, a fresh-faced young professor by the name of Hal Hirschfeld, who had done some uh, very fascinating work. I'm not going to dig too deep into it now, but... Uh, they were attempts using technology and, and other things to help us connect to our future selves and how that might impact our financial behavior. Uh, I've lost several people, it seems like, at least their picture. Hal, are you still with me? Yep. Yep. Okay. I've lost your picture, but we'll get that back. Uh, in short, uh, I talked to Hal and stayed in touch with him and found that he had uh, written this amazing new paper, a theoretical paper, he'll tell us more about the status of it, um, about how we can rethink how we think about time and how it have implications for us, not just financially, but uh, throughout our lives. Um, so to begin, I'd like to toss it to you, Hal, to sort of give everyone a, a brief overview of how the paper came about and, and what you discuss and, and sort of what it's all about. Sounds good. Um, thanks so much for organizing, Jeff, and then thanks, Kim, Ari, and Lori for participating it's it's uh i feel like i'm a, on the brady bunch right now but i also feel <laughs> very lucky to uh to to have such great thinkers uh be thinking about this piece um so just by way of background um cassie uh, mcgillner holmes who's my colleague at ucla and jennifer ocker who's our colleague at stanford had been talking for a while about the way that time uh is treated in the literature um and we, we started with the idea that there's been a there's been a lot of researchers in social psychology, marketing, behavioral economics, management, et cetera, philosophy, um, who have written about the topic of time and how people deal with it. Uh, but we realized that as of late, there hasn't been as much synthesis of of the literature in the last, you know, whatever you want to call it, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so we thought, you know, this might be a good time to step back and and read what's been written um, and see how the topic has been treated. Uh, and in doing so, we, we recognize that, you know, a, a couple of things. One, and, and I will try to keep this relatively brief, but, you know, time comes up in these sub-disciplines 
normally in relation to the ways that people have difficulties dealing with it. So we have time mm-hmm. pressure. Uh, we don't feel like we have enough time. Um, we overweight the present and underweight the future, um, uh, um, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we, we realized in, in reading the literature that, uh, you know, what seems to occur is that people make wildly different decisions for things that are occurring right now in the present uh, than the way that they think that they would want to decide when thinking about maybe those same things in the future. And so you often see this dichotomy between whether we want to call it the now or the present uh, and other points in time, whether it's the past or the future. Much of the research is really dealt with now and later, but I think you can make an equally well-reasoned case for now and something that happened before. Um, and you know, it occurred to us in reading this that this is, this is how we think about time. Uh, this is how people go through time. Uh, but in reality, creating these sort of distinctions between now and later, between the present and the future, or the present and the past, may set us up for dealing with some of these very same difficulties uh, that the literature has been talking about. Um, uh, namely, I think the idea that we're grappling with is that when we set up these sort of dichotomies between now and later, uh, people end up thinking about many of their decisions uh, in terms of a, of a weather, you know, whether I should do this thing or not, you know, whether I should spend extra money, whether I should suffer right now to, to feel better later, you know, whether I should eat this chocolate dessert, now it's always a chocolate dessert, whether I should eat this thing right now uh, and not later. Um, And we realized that the the sort of weather distinction uh, may not be the best distinction um, and that a different way of looking at time could be one in which we say when more. So thinking about, okay, if I'm going to look at my life in general, when am I doing X? And when am I doing why and sort of distributing punishments and rewards or sacrifices and rewards, however you want to call it, over time. Now, in the in the paper, we essentially frame this as either having what we call sort of a ground level perspective, which which is what we speculate is the way most people walk through life. That is thinking about sort of everything that's right in front of us, where the, the present is sort of all encompassing and then the past and the future seem to sort of fade off into the distance or having more of what we're calling a bird's eye view perspective where we can sort of take a, take a step away and see how everything is connected in our lives. I think the analogy that Cassie actually came up with was taking more of a mosaic perspective. Hey, Laura, um, could I ask you to hold up that, uh, those figures that you had printed out? Or I think Kim Oh, sure. Yep. I think you. So, here's so that was figure the, one and um, figure two. Yeah. That's so the, the ground <laughs> perspective and the elevated perspective. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. That, that was basically the best way that we could think to sort of represent the way we're thinking about this. And, you know, I, I should maybe uh, stop there with just two caveats. One is that this is very much a theoretical paper where we were, we were trying to synthesize the literature and come up with a slightly different way of thinking about time. Um, I, you know, I consider us to some extent on borrowed ground here because we haven't yet empirically tested whether or not this so-called bird's eye view perspective could lead to better outcomes, better psychological outcomes, namely less stress, more patient decision-making, possibly increased well-being. Um, these are speculations right now. We have some early pilot data suggesting that if on a measured level, if we can sort of measure somebody's tendency to think one way versus another, those who tend to take the bird's eye view perspective seem to uh, have higher levels of well-being. But again, this is pilot data. We haven't yet figured out what the best way is to experimentally induce these perspectives. Um, so I just want to be clear that, you know, we're really, really sort of speculating on this based on 
past research, based on past theory, and based on our own way of thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's a great caveat to have, I and mean, we're, we're not presenting hard findings here, but it's, it is based upon its uh, sort of educated best guess. And, and since you brought up the, the fact that it is theoretical, I'm going to turn now to Lori, um, because I, you know, I would love to get your perspective as a philosopher. I mean, we'll, we'll get to sort of some of the practical things and applications in, in a moment, but um, thinking about this elevated perspective of time, whether it's across one's life or across a year, uh, what are the implications um, for you and your work potentially, and how does this match up with other things that you've seen in your study of time and the way people approach their decisions? So, so great. I think um, the paper is super interesting and it does connect with a lot of um, philosophical topics about time and temporal experience and also about decision making. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the connections I see um, with respect to thinking about time and decision making and then connect it also how, for me personally, how I see it relating to some of my own work. So one, in, my, in, in, in some of the work um, where I talk about sort of our temporal perspective, I talk about this problem a little bit in the sense of, you know, we have this tendency to throw our future selves under the bus, right? Like, and if you're a good decision maker, you shouldn't, don't throw your future self under the bus. Don't, you know, if, you know, every reviewer knows, or, you know, every person who's asking you to do an unpleasant task knows that if they ask you to do that unpleasant task significantly in the future, you're much more likely to say yes, right? Okay, so, um, and and I, uh, I agree that the key to um, thinking about this issue involves having um, a more nuanced perspective, like taking the bird's eye point of view. But I also think that work in philosophy suggests that uh, you need to coordinate that with the on the ground perspective, okay? So it's, and I don't think you're suggesting that we'd have to do anything other than that, but rather it's not just a bird's eye, bird's eye view, it's not just having the immersed in time view, but rather coordinating between the two. Here's an example, um, both taking it, using it as an analogy, a spatial view about why that's so essential. So think about what you're suggesting as, the, as an analogous to what we get when we use Google Maps, right? What you want is, a, is the spatial array, right? To see the terrain that you're, that, 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 that you're on. And then you need to point yourself on the map because if you have a map and you don't know where, you are, where you're located, the map is totally useless, right? On the other hand, if you don't know, if you haven't got a map, then you can't make plans and goals because you don't know which direction you have to go. You can't make the right kinds of decisions. Oh, I'm gonna have to like move a little to the left and move to the right. So what you're saying is, look, we need a temporal map perspective as well as you know focusing on how, where we're located right on that map. And yeah. I think yeah. that's ex exactly right. Um, and so, and just for a temporal analogy, um, old stories like uh, I told you I'm an expert. Well, I didn't tell you this, but I think I wrote that I was an expert on time travel, and I'm fascinated <laughs> with you know temporal location. But if you think about old stories like the Rip Van Winkle story, where um, you know someone's put to sleep for many many years and they wake up and they don't know wh when they are. It's not just they don't know where; they don't know when they are. Or Ripley in the, one of the Aliens movies, she goes into hyperspace, and then when she wakes up, the first thing she wants to know is what time is it? What <laughs> year is it? Because if you don't know when you are. You can't plan, you can't explain, you can't act. Or similarly, you get immersed in a really good book and then suddenly you look up and you think, oh, what time is it? So you have your immediate sense, but you need to know what the clock time is. You look at your watch, you coordinate between your in in immersed time and your, you know, your map sense, and then you rush off to your meeting, right? Okay, so this is involves what philosophers talk about as indexicality. Um, and, um, and I think what you're pointing out is it's really important to have both this kind of, um, like a gentle or immersed view, as well as a more observational or map perspective. Mm, so yeah. If you think about computer games, the same thing happens. If you occupy, you occupy the boots of your character, but then you also have the map often, mm. and you yeah. coordinate like your actions by coordinating between the two, right? So I think the concepts are there, and what you're doing is kind of connecting all of this. Great analogies. Like so that. yeah, I think that you can be useful <laughs> to get people to see, you know. Yeah. Um, and just, just as a note to my own work, um, so some of what I'm talking about here also is, I mean, I, I work on these issues and I like to think about them a lot with respect to time and space and self, but I also work on transformative experience and decision making. And those are, um, um, that's a class of cases where we, um, involving, let me just explain for those um, who aren't familiar with it, um, we sometimes get faced with what I think of as transformative experiences, which are life-changing experiences, and they're radical changes um, and the thought is that when there are new kinds of changes for us, there's a distinctive way in which we can't know what to expect. We might know through testimony, for example, by others, you know, what it's going to, that, that things that are going to happen to us when we become new parents or when we emigrate to another country or when we descend into Alzheimer's, things like that. But there's a sense in which we don't know what it's going to be like for us. And so there's a, an epistemic dimension that we can't 
plan for in the ordinary way, okay? That doesn't mean we can't plan. It's just that there's a way of recognizing a certain kind of unknowability and uncertainty that's coming down the pike and then preparing ourselves for that appropriately. And so one of the things I like about the paper is that I think um, it brings out the importance of having, a, you know, having this kind of map, temporal map perspective. And when you highlight ways in which we, things that we can't know, so it's like there are blank spaces on the map that you're going to have to navigate, then knowing that there's a, a, a part of the map that you can't navigate is the best preparation, really. I mean, if, if testimony will help you, but if you can't imaginatively kind of, you know, present yourself in that situation or to say, prepare yourself for difficult choices or know what you want to choose in that situation ahead of time, then the best thing to do is to prepare yourself epistemically for the unknowability. And again, the bird's eye view is really important for that. That, thank you, Laura. That was great. And I particularly struck a chord with me the, uh, the Google Maps. Yesterday I was trying to get back, taking the directions, and I wanted to change because I knew something happened on the road and it kept pushing me back and I couldn't. So anyway, I don't want to bore you with my traffic nightmares. Uh, but it does bring up you know, this idea of the map and, and changing where you're going, the, the unintended consequences uh, of perhaps taking this perspective or being um, limited to it. So, Kim, I, I want to turn to you. Uh, you know, you study um, the sort of the psychology of intergenerational decisions, uh, for lack of a more accurate phrase, but I think that, that sums it up somewhat. Tell me more about that. But I, I wonder, um, what are the potential unintended consequences here of taking this perspective? I mean, Laura mentioned, like, you can take the big view, but you have to know where you are still. Um, do you see in your work or your, your thoughts about this paper other potential areas um, that might cause hiccups in our, in our progress. Um, so first, I just wanted to thank you for sharing this thought-provoking paper with me and for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, the paper was written with a primary focus on helping uh, how this elevated, how uh, individuals, on a, uh, the focus was on individuals and how um, adopting the elevated perspective can help people to improve their lives and well-being. But as I read through the paper, I automatically processed it uh, with a consideration of broader societal level issues in mind and thought about how an elevated perspective of time could potentially affect our behavior and outcomes as a collective. Um, humans have evolved in such a way that putting a stronger focus on the present has helped us to survive. And that instinct is still hardwired in. Um, but we now have an unprecedented ability to uh, affect the future, not just our own, but the futures of other people in generations to come, people who don't even exist yet. Um, so, and it's ironic that this instinct that has evolved to help us survive is now not only compromising our ability to thrive as a collective, but in some domains could conceivably contribute to our extinction. So it's like our instincts aren't synchronized with our ability to affect the future. They haven't caught up. Um, and I also think that because of our unprecedented ability to affect the future on a mass global scale, that it would be great if the elevated perspective could incorporate an even more holistic perspective that included other people as well as oneself. Um, so the analogy of shifting between the diff different calendar views was really helpful. and. Um, as I mentioned before we started, the figures were very effective in capturing and conveying the ideas of the paper. And I really like the idea mentioned at the end of the paper, pe people being able to shift more flexibly between the grounded and elevated perspectives. Um, I worried about the person on the cloud staying there all the time yeah. because of the risk of dwelling too much in the past or finding the future so daunting that it actually hinders action in the present. So, um, you you know, we can maybe get these things all visible, maybe they're all relevant, but they're not all relevant in the same way. So, you know, the past is relevant, we can learn from the past, and it's, it's important to learn from the past, but we don't want to dwell, dwell in it, and we can actually change the present and future. You can change perceptions and memory of the past, but, you know, in some ways, they have a different type of importance. Um, so I thought, and the future isn't relevant if we don't survive in the present. So that's actually important to acknowledge as well. So I thought it was helpful for the person to get up on the cloud, gain perspective, understanding, and motivation, and strategize about what to do in the present to account for the future. But I also thought that he or she should climb down from there and sometimes focus 
on the present to get things done and survive. Um, on the other hand, short-termism, as Ari has pointed out, and um, his work is such a huge obstacle and challenge that if we strive for the elevated perspective, we might naturally achieve just the right balance. Um, I, I think people need optimism biases about the past and the future in order to persist. And if we think about what needs to be done for the future to be healthy or viable as a society, it can be so daunting that it can be incapacitating. So get the elevated perspective long enough to figure out what you need to do in the present and to gain the future you desire or envision. Uh, but then don't dwell on it so much that it causes you to give up hope because it's not totally clear how to make it attainable. Um, so take a look at the month calendar, but then get back to your day or week view. Um, and as we figure out how to get people to the elevated perspective, we also need to figure out how to help people switch back and forth and how to figure out just the right amount or the right times for switching perspectives. So those are, those are my big thoughts. And I also did think about, um, I don't know if I should save this for concluding comments, but um, with respect to getting on the, to the elevated perspective, Leveraging what we know about legacies is promising. Research on legacies shows that when people think about their legacy, it simultaneously gets them to be more other-oriented and more future-oriented. Um, it blurs the lines between self and other, present and future. Um, it helps uh, brings others and future closer to us. And reflecting on their legacy can help people get on that elevated time perspective, even in a more holistic way. Both considering the past, present, and future of themselves and others. Um, and as a bonus, it also helps to assuage the death anxiety associated with the passage of time in life that you mentioned at the end of the paper. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, that wasn't too long. That's <laughs> no, much. that was great. Thank you so much, Kim. And uh, one thing that particularly struck me when you're talking about people getting stuck on the cloud is you know, when we take this idea um, and try to make it more practical or apply it, it seems like it's going to be very, very personalized. You know, we, we often talk in behavioral science in general that you have to think about the context of, you know, applying a principle to something. But here it's almost down to the individual. You know, how do you react? Do you get stuck? Do you get fearful of the future? As you mentioned, you get stuck dwelling in the past. Um, and Ari, uh, with that sort of background, I want to turn to you uh, as someone who, you know, tell us a little bit more about Long Path and your work. But my understanding is you, you work to sort of help people apply taking a broader perspective or understanding times uh, to like have practical uh, impact. And, and I wonder what your reaction was to the paper, uh, where you see great potential, where you see um, you know, potential pitfalls, uh, and, and how on a more um, practical level this, this paper and the thoughts of this conversation might apply. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm excited to be on this, in, even, even invited into this illustrious group uh, and talking about this topic. The, the, the work that we're doing at Long Path Labs um, is specifically around how do we foster long-term thinking in individuals, organizations, and society, but around a very kind of uh, non-mundane goal, which is to ensure human species thriving over the next several hundred years. So, so our, our contention is if we do not have a mindset, a, a mindset shift that involves being able to take this perspective at the individual and, and higher strata levels, that we are in for some very rough times um, uh, as a species on this planet. And so, so to that end, the, this paper in many ways kind of fills a little bit of a gap that we've had in terms of thinking about the the extent research that is out there and the work that we're doing and the work that we're doing specifically is around this how do you develop how do you, how do you develop a mindset that allows you to go up to the cloud come back down but then also connect it with your own sense of purpose goals as well as ensuring that you see that you have agency in this um, and so that's that's a lot of what we've been doing. And my my first reaction, to be honest, with this paper was that I was surprised and delighted that it was coming mostly out of professors who are at a business school, because the dichotomy as as we've structured between present and future, and what that really leads to the kind of a scarcity mindset, in many ways, is what drives current GDP consumption patterns between you need to have this right now to be happy as opposed to having meaning. 
And so what's interesting is if this, it's, you know, I can say this for my closing arguments, but if this was to be blown up further and truly scaled, you know, post pilots and into the intervention mindset, it would be, it could potentially be very disruptive of current economic patterns in this country based on where most of our GDP comes from, which is about people being forced to make a decision between present and future self, mostly gearing towards the present and basically buying stuff that they don't need, but that fuels the economy. So in some ways, this paper feels like you should have come out of the philosophy department, but instead it came out of a business school, which is somewhat shocking, but not really because it's, you know, it's, it's how out of the West Coast. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that was that was the thing that actually I mean there's a lot that jumped out at me and we'll get into it but mm -hmm. that jumped out at me right away was the dichotomy blowing past the dichotomy and what does that do for business in general and to that end how has that how have we as a society been calibrated to think in a dichotomy binary way and therefore it's not so much and the, and, the, and this paper gets at it it's not so much that we're having to go to something new, it's that we're returning to something very old. So remember this now and later cyclical way of thinking was how we were from probably 120,000 years ago up until 10 or 12,000 years ago when we hit the agricultural revolution. And then we had to start thinking in terms of no longer cyclical seasonal ways, but really in, in very sharp contrasted ways. And we can get into the, the Marxist socioeconomics of it, but, but again, those are the things that kind of jumped out at me right away. Great. Great. Um, thanks. So I have a bunch of reactions to what's been said, but I don't want to dominate this. And I, I see a lot of you all nodding along as everyone voiced their opinions. Hal, in a second, I'll give you an opportunity to maybe respond yeah. or, or add on to a few of the thoughts that came up. It's not a, yeah. this is not yeah. your, uh, a defense of your PhD or anything. So no, 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 um, of course. Yeah. And, and I just invite anyone, if you, if you want something to chime in, literally just raise your hand, I'll make a, note, make a note, and I'll get to you. I know there's a lot to talk about, and ironically, we have limited time, but nonetheless, Hal, uh, what, what's some of your reaction to what yeah. some people say? The, these are great. I mean, the, these thoughts are great, and I, you know, it's pushed, just in the last 10 minutes, has pushed my perspective further on this. I think, you know, let me just respond to a couple of them. I, I, I love, I, I think both Lori and Kim are talking about this sort of being, ability to shift between these different perspectives. I love the Google Maps analogy. I think that is, you know, really apt for what we're talking about here. Um, you know, I, I would say um, in a lot of the work that's gone into this paper, both our, you know, the individual research that Cassie does and Jennifer does and, and I do, I think a lot of what we call for is, you know, having people be more future oriented, et cetera. But, um, What's rarely written about is the idea that it's not meant that we're asking people to shift, you know, all the way to being future oriented, but having some balance. You know, I, I'm often fond of saying, you know, if you are only future oriented, you can end up later in life with, you know, no memories to look back on. You sort of, you know, hurt your future self in another way. Um, so, and, and I think Kim's point was really sharp that, you know, it, the, the dominant mode of thinking, you know, vis-a-vis -vis what some of what Ari has talked about can be so sort of ground level focused that a little bit this way, I don't know that we're gonna be you know, in danger of having people only be on the elevated perspective or only be future oriented. It may just actually naturally cause them to be more future sort of balanced, if you will. Um, you know, and then t t two other th a couple other things I wanna react to, which is I, you know, Lori's point about transformative experiences and know, you know, the, the knowing that you might not be able to know what is to come uh, you know, I think that's a, it's a, it, it's really a fascinating idea. Uh, and one that I think it's under, under look, under, under examined a lot in the literature, which is to say, we might not know our future preferences, but also recognizing that once we become our future selves, those very preferences may change. And I mean, I think I'm quoting directly from your, from your book, Larry, and you know, knowing that, know, knowing that there's that unknowability is another way of saying, you know, I think there should, can be some balance between now and the future. And this is something that we have to allow for, um, that we can have a map, but parts of the map might not be totally colored in, but we know something exists there. Um, you know, and, and I think sort of that dovetails really well with a lot of what 
Kim has talked about in her research and what Ari does in practice, which is to say, there's these whole groups of people who we don't know. <laughs> we don't know their preferences, but we know that it's going to be important that they survive um, if, if we think anything is true about our own preferences now. And so figuring out the ways that we can take some of these ideas from the sort of personal space and, you know, the three of us are coming from the perspective of being in a marketing discipline and more of a psych background, which is, <clears throat> I think, orients us a little bit more on the individual than the collective. I think it, you know, you may argue it's even more important to, 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 to bring this up to the collective level. And I, you know, I think Kim's point about trying to bring in legacy motivations um, is really smart because uh, that, you know, implicit in that is the idea that there has to be some balance between what exists now, and that's kind of a big now of sorts, and what exists later, and, and to some extent what exists in the past. You know, I think if, if we start thinking about the legacy we're leaving, we're also thinking about the legacy that's been left for us. Um, so, you know, I, 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 and I think Ari's, Ari's perspective there um, that, you know, this is a this is a collective issue uh, is well it's 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 really important from a I, I mean I think you're talking about almost from a macroeconomic standpoint I hadn't I hadn't considered that before but you know it's you think what are the sort of infrastructure societal norms and pressures that give rise to more of the dichotomous thinking that make it so much harder to sort of you know take this slightly different perspective and and are there ways to change those you know almost from a roundabout perspective i don't know i mean that 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 can get into sort of uh you know political economy of sorts anyway let me let me stop there and just say you know i think these are these are great points to jump off of too yeah uh, there's there's a lot to dig into a lot of implications from the individual to broader society uh, does anyone have any particular strong reaction to anything that that hal just added on to to their perspective Sure, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so so um, I just wanted to ask, um, this is related to the, everything that you were saying, but I also, when I read the paper, thought that there was a natural connection, not just to time, but as a philosopher would say, modality, in other words, possibility. And that's been embedded in the things that you're talking about, because decision making, especially under standard models, involves uncertainty, uh, um, or as I also needs to include unknowability. But there, it's not just that there's one future self, but there are many possible future selves. And part of taking the bird's eye view isn't just stepping back and looking at your future, like the future times, but also looking at possible future times and trying to decide which future self to make actual, correct? Yes. So, so I guess I thought that a natural way to read maybe, um, maybe you know, the next step or some, or some, or the, I mean, a sort of an implicit part of your project was to say, we take a bird's eye view, not just of um, ourselves in time, but ourselves in um, in, in terms of possibility, right? Yeah. So that we can, um, and, and by doing so, sort of recognizing, well, you know, um, how, how to put it, um, when I'm making, or I'm thinking about um, various things I'm doing, I'm sort of charting a path through, um, sort of through a field of possibilities. This is, this is a, um, a sort of metaphor that sometimes comes up in various kinds of contexts. And I have to choose you know, how I want to chart my path. And to be able to do that, I need to kind of, you know, look at least, you know, have a sense of the different kinds of possibilities that I'm considering. And if I'm, if I'm not, if I'm just focusing on the actual, again, right, just like you said, if I don't take the bird's eye point of view, then I won't, you know, perform, like, at least I won't be able to, at least in some subjective sense, be able to kind of perform as rationally as I need to be able to do to make uh, down the line investment decisions and retirement. So I just wanted to, I wanted to make sure that, this is actually part of the picture that you that you wanted to endorse because I think that that again also makes makes perfect sense and um, is it sounds like a really kind of nice practical way of embedding a lot of theoretical insights that yeah yeah let me just respond briefly which is to say and then and then like Kim Kim and Ari jump in too which is to say I mean I think that's absolutely right you know there's you, you could take the sort of deterministic perspective that everything is laid out. If I take this bird's eye view, you know, mm. th this is where the, the Google map analogy almost breaks down to some extent. It's just that, you know, 
it's not that everything is perfectly laid out here. It could right, go right, this way, that way, right, that, you know, right, or maybe, right, maybe, they, right. maybe that does work because you have different routes. I don't know. We have to think about it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that's absolutely right. You know, I think that, and it's not something that we had made explicit and perhaps it, it, it should be that, you know, part of taking this perspective is recognizing that things could go multiple different directions. And of course, that's one way that we deal with uncertainty. Um, right you know, is knowing or at least considering some of these possibilities and recognizing that there's ones that we haven't considered that could still arise, right? Right. Can I just, yeah. if you want another example, I, I like examples. Think of like when um, you're thinking about doing a renovation on your house, right? And so your architect spreads out, it fans out a whole bunch of different plans. What do you have to do? Well, you have to first, again, there's the immersive point. Imagine yourself in each possible new breakfast nook or whatever it is. But also you have to have a sense of what you're choosing between, right? I mean, it's not like any architect that only puts one set of plans before you. You need a new architect, right? You need to like right, have the right. space of possibilities presented to you so that you can plan effectively. So, you know, yeah, the modality, spatiality, temporality, I think different different sort of analogies work to bring yeah, out the different yeah, dimensions. That's great. So, yeah. I think, I think that you, thinking about the uncertain future, like from this present forward, we can plan it, but we don't really know what it is. It was something that really resonated with me because there was a point where you talked about how thinking this way can help reduce stress and guilt because we can think, oh, well, I'll spend time with my kids later, even if I'm not doing it now. Mm -hmm. and, um, that particularly mm -hmm. strikes yeah. me. You might hear my crying baby in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I wonder like, if that is the only sort of practical application to help us sort of cope better with our present decisions or if there are broader uh, sort of applications to be done given all the uncertainty. Um, and, and Ari and, and, and Kim, um, I wonder if either of you have any um, sort of perspective on like what could we do with it? I mean, given the, the, the great sort of philosoph philosophical and theoretical view, what can we do to apply this or, or what do we need to be aware of or, or, or sort out? So, well, I mean, one of the um so I, was, I thought about this paper so much. I was um, thinking about it even in the middle of the night last night. <laughs> you know, a bit earlier, but I was I came up with I sent um, Jeff some last minute discussion questions, and uh, this is something that I'm sure Hal has been thinking about because you know I want to do this experiment. I, we have developed this really effective legacy induction task, which I think is going to get people on that elevated perspective, at least for a little while. But we have to know how to determine sure. how we got to the elevated perspective. So I'm wondering if you have started to develop some way to measure. And also, I'm just interested in your ideas about what do we know from other behavioral um, science that can be leveraged to facilitate this process. So I, I just think we can put your measures together with my legacy prime and we're going to get results. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure you have already thought maybe you're even doing some of this with your piloting. Um, yeah. You know, the, those, those that are early empirical work can really actually help to form, in, inform and form your theory. So it can be just kind of, you know, I'm sure you're already doing some of that. So I'm kind of curious as to what you have going on <laughs> yeah no th this is great i mean that's you're you're sort of in my head right now that's exactly you know exactly where we're thinking um so cassie jennifer and i and then our uh, uh doctoral student joseph reef um have been trying to figure out okay well so how can we measure this um and then with the idea then how can we try to well manipulate this get somebody onto this perspective or not um and we have not done the sort of formal questionnaire development that I think is required. We've just started piloting different ways of saying, you know, to what extent do people agree with various statements that essentially come out of the theoretical writing? You know, to what extent do you think of your life in these mosaic patterns or think about the past, present, and future together? You know, I, do I think that they're equally weighted or I tend to look at things, you know, one way versus another? And what we've been trying to do so far is measure this alongside other um, social, psychological, or you know, even just behavioral um, and individual differences. You know, things like, like, are you more of an abstract thinker or concrete level? I mean, I think this is something that comes up in the literature is that there's some relation between this and construal level theory, which l looks at the extent to which we see things more abstractly or more concretely. Um, and, and and we're getting some initial evidence that we can at least tease this apart from some of the other existing individual difference measures that may be out there. Um, 
I, you know, one thing that we're grappling with, though, in trying to measure this is um, that context matters. You know, it may be the case that some people are more prone to this way of thinking, generally speaking, or it may be the case that some people are more prone to this way of thinking <clears throat> in certain decision making contexts versus others. And I think, Kim, this is where you're saying, you know, empirical work can inform and form theory, which is to say, that's something that we don't know the answer to yet. And I, you know, I'd love to, to, to drill down to that. Your idea about then trying to induce or use the legacy primes as a way of manipulating this, I think is spot on. You know, I think we, we hadn't considered that. And, I, you know, this is, we'll have to talk back channel. I think that's something that we should probably consider. I don't think there should be any secret back channels here. I think we've all... <laughs> or at least tell us sometime in the future yeah, what we discuss. Yeah, I want to hear. We have enough of that going on right now, yeah. Arya, I'd love to have you jump in. Uh, you you either are a very pensive person or you've had a very pensive sort of resting face. Um, what, what sort yeah, of resonated in the... Or maybe my, maybe my Skype connection is so bad it just froze on a pensive face. Excellent. Um, Go ahead. What's, what's so resonated with you? Be, 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 because I'm coming to this conversation... Um, as a non-academic, I'm not bound by the same rules yes. in terms of having to get all the ducks in a row before we go out into the field and start testing. So, so we've already created the interventions around this, and we're already testing them, right? So we do a couple of things. We run, we're running a, these workshops called the Long Path Journey that are very much being beta tested right now, very much. Um, and we basically, they're wrapped around this idea that before we can get people to be a long path thinker, which really means they're thinking not not only do they have empathy for their current self, but there's also a reckoning and empathy for past self and those who came before them, the legacy they've inherited, but also the legacy they want to live out in their current day to day so that uh, that's actually what they give to future generations. So our work is is the past and present that that Hal has laid out, but we actually go a little bit higher. And, it's, and we're, we're testing to see if this works, we go higher in that they go outside of their own bounded lifetime. So we ask them to go about 100 years back and 100 years in the future based on current um, you know, life expectancies. And so the, our, our thinking is that you will be able to make better decisions today and have a more meaningful life today if you understand where you come in the chain of being that goes back hundreds of years and goes forward hundreds of years. Now, the, the issue that arises, and I'm sure Kim is thinking this right now, and this is the kind of Ernest Becker in me, is that when we prime people around either legacy priming or, or to take this meta cloud perspective that's transgenerational in their being, so you see that, so they become more like links in a chain, that it obviously gets them to have to think about their own mortality and their own death. The research, a chunk of research shows that, I think some of it's from some of the people on this call, that when people are asked to actually come face to face with their own death, they can, but not always, I think it depends on the person, actually become more short term in their thinking. And so the question is, how do we build a series of interventions that allow them to take this transgenerational empathic view on the world and their decision makings, but at the same time recognizing that we're gonna run up against their own mortality, which may have the inverse effect that we're trying to cause. Um, so that's both a, a statement of kind of what we're doing and we're, we're, we're out there testing these as guided visualizations with hundreds of people. Um, and at the same time, the wrestling with the kind of denial of deathism that comes into play when you ask people to take a certain bird's eye view, not only of their own life, but of bigger lives in general. And that's, that's a little bit of the conundrum that we come up against. And so in thinking about this paper, like how far out can they go on the map um, before they have to hit their own death? And what does, does that cause them? Can they transcend that? Or does it cause them to recoil and become even more presentist? It's, it's fascinating. Uh, ironically, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, uh, so, and this feels like it could be part one of a hundred uh, talks on this. So uh, I'm going to go around and give everyone a chance to sort of give their, their final thoughts. I, I realize there's like a hundred open questions here, but I think, <laughs> I, I think we've, we've made some good 
connections and open some back channels apparently. Um, so uh, I will just start, and, and, and Hal, I'll give you the last word since it's your paper, and, and just so you know, I'll come, uh, I'll come to Lori next, then, then Kim, then Ara, then Hal. Uh, for me, when I think about, it strikes me um, personally in terms of my career, uh, I often say I have a, a, a tapestry in my career because I've done many different things, even if right now it feels like I'm plodding along through the muck and mire. Um, I don't, by the way. My bosses, if they watch this, it's great. Uh, so, so it resonates with me in, in that way. And, and as I mentioned a couple times, it feels like there are individual ways that this paper and the ideas here can resonate. Um, so I, I was excited to read it. I was really uh, honored that you all joined us to get these different perspectives. Um, so, uh, Lori, if I, if I may, uh, any, any last words for now on what we've discussed? Ah. So, yeah, so I really enjoyed the conversation, and I was um, very pleased to be uh, invited and involved. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I want to say that with respect to my own work, I think the paper is, again, super interesting, really relevant, and we were discussing, you know, this idea of, like, the unknowability and basically understanding how you have to respond in the moment, but then adjudicating that both from being immersed and having a bird's eye point of view. And so I hope I can both draw on, on this paper and also I'm super interested, the empirical discussion was really interesting and I'd love to see how some of these possibilities play out. Um, and Ari's, um, especially some of the, the, the kind of sociological elements of, the, of, of Ari's remarks were also, I, I thought, sort of incredibly uh, engaging. Um, I'll mention that I think there's another tie in here to some philosophical discussions about narrativity and narrativity of the self in time. Um, I would just say, I mean, there's a lot of different discussions there, but the way I like to think about it is there's a, there's, a, there's a way of thinking about constructing oneself and building oneself where you're telling, you're constructing the story of your life, right? And I also think that, um, again, everything that you're saying fits in really nicely with this, namely, look, you know, understand that it's not just about being in the moment, but it's also about stepping back and taking control of the story that you're telling and trying to kind of make the best sorts of decisions. You know, choose your own adventure. Again, you know, I like these examples, right? So think of it as, you know, when we're choosing our own adventure, we need to kind of take the bird's eye point of view so that we get the best possible um, outcome, at least uh, according to our lights. So again, thanks for having me participate. I, I love all the different examples and imagery that you've brought to this conversation. <laughs> uh, uh, Kim, uh, some last thoughts for now. So I just wanted to respond real quickly sure. to um, something Ari said. So in my research, both empirically and theoretically, we have um, I have used death crimes to help to um, enact legacy motivations. Um, at, but we also have developed a crime that does not bring up death, that kind of avoids some of those issues. We just you know have people think about how they want to be remembered and what kind of impact they want to have on the future. Um, but with respect to death, we've, we've also disentangled, there's two kinds of death awareness. There's death anxiety and death reflection. And there's and you can differentially prime those two different things. Death anxiety leads people to be more self-focused and self-protective. But if you can prime death reflection, it gets people thinking in, in broader ways, how to make your life meaningful rather than, oh, how do I live it up now before I die? Um, it's more like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, it's more of a cool cognitive process rather than, you know, a hot visceral focus. So the um, there is, there's some uh, promise there in terms of trying to disentangle that. Um, but also one of the things that I've been thinking, and um, this wasn't my prepared concluding comment, is just something I just thought of. Um, so sometimes what looks like is really present focused is just you um, sort of uh, acting out or implementing what you figured out when you were kind of on the, the cloud, the um, elevated perspective clause. So for example, you might be ignoring everything else and trying to make a deadline, not spending time with your kids, not sleeping, not going for the run because you're trying to get this paper out the door um, because that's what you have to do. So you got to go from your month view to your day view to get through that deadline, which enables you in the big picture to get tenure so you can support for your children better in the long term. So you actually figured that out from the big term perspective, but sometimes you just you have to, that's what I thought a lot about getting up and down from the cloud. So balance can be understood, and this is sort of captured in Hal's paper from, you know, rather than thinking of it as a day-to-day -day thing, you think of it as chapters in your life and, and that you get balance over time. Yeah. Um, so some chapters you need to spend more time on your work, some chapters you, you really, there's a health emergency, you need to spend more time with your kids, and it's more like 
it might look like you're ignoring other important things in the present, but really you're kind of implementing that bigger view. So strategize, but then get down from there and focus on what you need to do to kind of implement that strategy. So that was just something that I was thinking about that I thought would be really interesting to expand. Right. Well, the, for what it's worth, you warm my heart. My, my hope is that people in these talks don't just spew out prepared comments but have new thoughts and ideas. So yeah. thank you for that. Uh, Ari, no pressure. You're pensive looking and you've been given the new thought gauntlet. What can you do? With it? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, we'll pretend your prepared remarks are new. <laughs> yeah. let, me, let me read from the notes. No, I mean, what, I mean it's interesting because as with, with the, what this paper made me think of obviously was a visualization of, of going higher and up. But based on just literally the comments I just heard, especially from Kimberly, there's an element of this that's actually about becoming more um, fractal in your moment to moment. So it's, it's both potentially going up, but then also recognizing every moment is in, in the present and, and it just in, and you're here. But it also, if you have this perspective, this now and later, it makes every moment ostensibly fractal in that it also contains the moments that came before and all the moments that are to come. And in a sense, well, obviously we take a lot of this from, from Eastern modalities and ways of thinking, but what this paper can do, especially as it expands out, is increase not just happiness and, and lower stress, but true a true state of presence in the moment by de-entangling the anxiety about potentials and what is to come as opposed to just where you are right now. And I think in this, and, and what the paper kind of hints at, what I want to see it drive more is we're in a very specific moment in time, 2018, that is this, what we call the intertidal. So we have several hundred years of values and norms and narratives about how we should be and could be. And all of that is kind of coming to an end, if you will. And, and what is to come next, we don't know. But what's being laid out by this paper is ways of thinking and contemplating that potentially can take away the anxiety of what is to know, right? There's this, there's this saying going around right now, the official future is dead. Long live the futures with an S and a plurality. And I think this type of mindset and this type of perspective can ease the anxiety of of knowing and being okay with the not knowing of what is to come because it takes away the pressure of having to know exactly what you're going to do, which is the way we've been trained to think over the past couple of hundred years. So I'm, I'm thankful for having been included in this conversation to just get the ball rolling here. Great. Thank you. Thanks. And, and I, we've enjoyed your perspective. Um, my making fun of your leaning in, notwithstanding, I apologize. Uh, Hal, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you, uh, I'll, I'll do a little tiny wrap at the end, but I'll give you the last word. You've had the first word, you've had the paper. There's a lot for people to digest uh, if they want to look at that. Um, so don't try to cover everything, but a succinct sort of, what do you want yeah. people to walk away from, from this with? Sure, let me, let me just, I, I think of, I don't, I don't want to spend too much more time uh, rehashing, but I'll, I'll just say one thing, which is that uh, an earlier version of the paper, we were trying to put our finger on what exactly we were talking about. And we had started talking about the idea of the past and the future blending together and that, you know, the, the, the future is the present, the present is the future, et cetera. Um, and then we realized that that's not really the right analogy, that it's really more of this idea that I think that all, you know, everybody just essentially brought up, which is that uh, there's a sense of coexistence uh, between the past and, and present and the present and future and, and, and multiple futures, which is to say, you know, you, you can, I mean, I think Kim's point is a good one. You can get down and do something that may be really necessary for right now with still keeping the future in mind. And you can also step up and say, I need to step back and do something that's better for the long run, uh, compared to what's maybe good for right now. Um, but, you know, I think the the idea that we're trying to grapple with is is more balance and coexistence and essentially blending. Um, so, I mean, I'll I'll leave it there and say I think you know there's a lot of work to be done both in an empirical level um, and also you know in a continued theoretical one to figure out exactly the context we're talking about when this might be useful, um, what outcomes 
may arise from this, what outcomes can't be touched on this, and you know, can this expand out to more of the collective uh, rather than just the personal? So let me thank you guys. I mean, this is just a great conversation and really, I mean, it's it's helped it's helped my thinking. I'll go back to my co-authors and talk about this as well. So thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, I will uh, I'll attach all of your um, your bios and stuff to whatever we publish here. But uh, that this was a really great conversation. I feel like we could continue for a long time. Uh, but I appreciate you being part of this experiment, discussing an experimental paper. Uh, once again, Hal Hirschfeld, Lori Paul, Kimberly Wade Benzoni, and Ari Wallach. I'm Jeff Chrysler for People Science. Thank you all.